Did everyone have a chance to review the minutes that um, I had edited and Rhea had edited um, an award document that we sent around? Does anyone have any further edits? Oh, just my spelling. There's oh, was it? Are missing in Chandrasekhar? In some of the instances, not all of them, just a few. Okay. okay. I global change to people's names, so it's probably at that. <laughs> That's okay. Anyone else edits to that? No? Okay. So um, I entertain a motion to approve the minutes as edited, and John, you have that copy, and as, um, and with the corrections for your name. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, good. All right, so I thought we'd dive right into the business, hours of business operation. Um, I asked John, and he very nicely put together this table, which he also had handouts of, um, that um, lists what we have in our bylaws as well as some surrounding towns. And um, we really don't have a lot in our bylaws in terms of limits on hours of operation. It's just uh, things in residential districts, you know, in-home businesses, not to um, be past 8 p.m., so 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. And it's just the retail stores within, I think, industrial A and B, is that um, the commercial listing? So it's, it's just... Uh, just that specific thing, retail stores within that, those districts, up to 10 p.m. You can, uh, can you double check which districts that is? Yep. Um, 37 is, 34 and 37, I th think that's industrial A and B, but I don't know about 184. And, um, and then, by special permit. I don't think the dog daycare facility requires a lot of discussion, but um, <laughs> but then by special permit. But um, does anyone have um, knowledge of you know just the general practice on special permits in town? And um, there seems to be a general sense that we don't have things open much past a certain time. But you know, do you know what it is? Since it's not in our bylaws, it's just just in special permits and things. Anyone? I no? think that start line it has permission to be open until ten o'clock on certain nights. That's my understanding. And Bill's closes at ten o'clock, but I don't know if that's business practice or if it's um, a rule. It's uh, so. Cornell's is open later than that. Yeah. That's um, true. I thought that Central Public House was open till 11, but I could be wrong. I think it's, One time my impression ground. is that it's totally discretionary when you go to get your liquor license. It's kind of determined at that point if it's a liquor establishment. Otherwise, when you go through the permit process, mm -hmm. kind of ask for what you want, and it's established at that point. Mm -hmm. But I'm not entirely sure that that's possible. That's uh, correct. And then the 24 hour operation at Cumberland Farms. Is it 24 hour? It was, is it yes, 24 hours? 24 hours at Cumberland Farms and Price Chopper. And those were both in the, in the permit. Mm -hmm. okay. yeah, according to Google, Central Public House is open till 11. Okay, thank you. Can you double check Cornell's, see if they have a website? And that's 24 hour. Okay. And I know the, um, the other, across from Cumberland Farms, that was granted All 24 time. hour because it's, you know, consistent. All time. right. Yeah, that's one. <laughs> it says 1 a.m. 1 a.m., okay. That seems consistent. That's across, sort of across the street from where I live, so I think that's consistent with <laughs> when I've heard or seen some people leaving. Yeah. Okay, okay. So it's all over the place. Um, and obviously has been done um, just based on the abutters, the very specific nature of each individual business and where it happens to be and what kind of business it is. So, and probably what the 
owners asked for at the time, partially. I mean, <laughs> so thoughts? I was just wondering if uh, the town is receiving a lot of complaints about the current zoning and you know, why is this, why are we letting people stay open this late or open this early? I, I'm just trying to figure out what the origin of this. What the, I'm sorry, what the what? The origin of, this, origin of this discussion. discussion. I had not heard that it was based on any complaints. Um, I think it was, you know, and I, I don't really recall where it came from on our work plan originally, but I think it was one of those things where we wanted to look at it and make sure that it wasn't. I, th I think when we were discussing the indoor entertainment, we were worried about the business hours and we wanted to take a look at the business hours to make sure that it's okay. not wide open from okay. what we do. From what I remember, I'm not 100% I'm not, I'm not sure. Okay, yeah. Yeah, and so I was thinking that it, it came from more like uh, consistency and, um, and making sure that we weren't particularly restrictive compared to other towns, so. I think it also partially came from we're, we're granting permits because other people have it and it's a little bit of creep and do we necessarily want 24-hour operations getting further into town or expanding further into town. I'm not sure it's anything that's anyone's brought up per se, but there was a discussion at one point that there's a certain level of inequity. You know, you give this business 24 hours and you're telling this guy he needs to close at 10. Seems unfair. It does, but do you want everything to be okay 24 hours? <coughs> you know, I don't think most businesses are going to want to be open 24 hours. No. Mm -hmm. I'm surprised, quite frankly, that Price Chapel wants to be open 24 hours. Oh boy, they, I remember talking to them when they went before the town. And they said there's no 24-hour grocery store for miles. And I said, so we're going to get people from all around the country way here going to Hockington Price Chopper. He said, yes. <laughs> I, it, he wasn't denying it, but they supposedly, you know, had the, the definition in their special permit regarding lights off and where the lights could be and all that, so whether or not those are happening or is a different story but you know if we're talking retail uh, establishments I think it's different than if we're talking about a laboratory with a third shift yeah. right do we happen to know of how many companies that are doing all-night operations how could we I don't know of any how could we get any information you don't know of any nobody on South Street nobody on not to my knowledge, but I think a lot of stuff just goes on until somebody says, hey, what's up with this? <laughs> you know, and so long as nobody says, hey, should they be doing this, it's not an issue. Do we have set hours for businesses, like for offices? No, nope, that's why we're talking nope. about this. <laughs> nope. Along the interchanges of 495, the summit travels a lot early in the morning. I like having a gas station open and a duck open at four o'clock, so. I agree, yeah. I mean, and, and it, it's right along 495, so it's, I wouldn't necessarily want a, you know, a downtown business necessarily to be open really late, but it's certainly convenient, and I, I think the, the creep can be stopped, I think, geographically. I think it should be a special permit based on different, you know, different qualities. I mean, so you're not getting truck traffic at four o'clock in the morning coming off of South Street with Jake Brakes and all, but Jake Brakes going down West Main Street four o'clock in the morning. <laughs> it's like. <laughs> True. And so if we if, if we're able to attract people that are traveling up and down 495, 
had to stop in and generate more business for the other ones in all town. Is it though? Yeah. Does our does our tax revenue change at all if Cumberland Farms yes. does a hundred percent better revenue wise? The assessor has the option of uh, assigning uh, the tax assessment based on the assessed value or the revenue at his discretion. Really? Really? Huh. Not know that. Have we ever done that? We're doing it right now. Are we? Several businesses saw their property or their real estate taxes go up over forty percent. Really? <laughs> so anyway, I mean, and so so the amount of revenue that a business generates is potentially beneficial to the town. So allowing them to stay open might help us. Ron, is that across the board beyond retailers? Yes. Interesting. I can go home now. I've learned something. <laughs> I know. We all have. <laughs> Take the rest of the month off. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I, I do think we have to be very careful of not having all night establishments creating noise and disturbances. Well, I don't. But I think the business somewhat regulates itself too. TJ Farms would never be. It wouldn't make sense for them to ever be open 24 hours. There's not going to be the traffic in the center of Hopkinton that would justify that for them. Um, however, in you know in places like closer to Boston and things like that, you know, there's often 24-hour CVS or something. Mm -hmm. yeah, certainly, Walmart I know. Walgreens is often yeah. open 24 hours. Certainly, when I had when I had babies in the house, you know, it was convenient to have a twenty-four hour um, type of drugstore. So, but so the, I, I'm confused because I hear about people saying, "Well, you know, this town goes to sleep so early." Well, the CVS was open twenty-four hours. You know, it would have some activity. There would be some life. There would be people coming and going to the CVS. I. I I, I'm not on one side or the other side of this conversation. I'm just saying it's very interesting when you think about what I've heard from different people about how they want this town not to be shut down at 10 o'clock mm -hmm. or 9.30. I think pharmacies particularly, if, if you have a sick child in the middle of the night, you want to Absolutely. Want something taken care of right now. You don't want to wait until 8 o'clock the next morning. So then you're encouraging 24-hour CVS in the center of town. That, is that what you're saying? See, I, I'm just, I'm, I'm, I'm just saying playing devil's advocate because it's like this is, these are the messages we're getting. Some people are like, well, no, we don't want to be like Newton or, or you know, the towns that are closer to Boston. We want to be sleepy and quiet and dark and all that stuff. But, you know, revenue-wise, as you're saying, I mean, if you're open that many hours, you're making a lot more sales because you are the one that's open, which is why Price Chopper really went for that 24 hour because it was at a questionable time whether or not there were enough sales for that store when they took that location. The 24 hour supermarkets are generally open because they have people in there restocking the shelves and there's very few customers, very few customers. that are there from, from you know, 11 p.m. until 5 a.m. But if somebody comes in and wants to buy something, they stop stocking the shelves and they go yeah. ring up the sale. I mean, it's, it's pretty efficient for them. Yeah. And it's convenient if you ever need that blah, blah, blah for whatever. Yeah. And, but again, I, I'm not sure that I would have wanted Kalala's to be open 24 hours right downtown. Right, I know. And uh, I think that that's really a dilemma is that for our downtown area, for Bills, Central Public House, and other businesses that may move in there, um, are they going to want to possibly be open later? You know, is that something that we would want? Do you know? Currently, they would need a special permit to do that. Yes, currently they would. So. Um, I don't know that we've been asked that. Um, when we were trying to get, you know, when Central Public House did decide to move in, for instance, um, I don't know that that they desired a later opening hour. I don't know if 
Question for John. Is that not tied to their liquor license? Do you know? I don't look into that. I mean, it might be to a certain standard, um, but if they have to receive a special permit and the planning board sets the hours, then no, it wouldn't be tied because the planning board would set the hours in the special permit, whereas the planning board doesn't issue the liquor license or administer the liquor license. Right. But I'd have to look to see if the state has <coughs> requirements on their liquor licenses. I'm just hours. curious as to whether or not it's something that they get to revisit every X number of years when your liquor license comes up for renewal. I don't know. I can look into that. That'd be great if you would. I don't think that we will uh, have a lot of restaurants downtown um, unless we, you know, allow them to be open a little bit later than 10, you know, so. 11 we've got for Central Public House, yeah. right, so. Um, I mean, personally, my opinion is the business is downtown. They should be allowed to be open a little bit later because it's downtown. That's usually like where the heart and action hour CVS. of yeah. the town is. And I mean, like I, I live in downtown, for example, but I sort of knew that purchasing my property, that there would be more action, there would be more noise because I'm in downtown. Yeah, exactly. But I feel like Hopkinton is a big, is a spread out enough town that if you want more of a sleepy area, there are neighborhoods in this town that are much more quiet. Yeah. And then there are neighborhoods that have much more action. So there aren't a lot of neighborhoods with a lot of action. <laughs> <laughs> no, not much. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> I don't think um, I don't think pushing it to like two a.m. or anything like that is something that. Uh, I think midnight is a reasonable time. Midnight would be yeah. Because then everybody, what, I, I think most people would leave by eleven. Mm -hmm. But if you tell the restaurant that they're allowed to stay open until midnight, they would be happier. And then you know if they're open till midnight four months and then everybody leaves by 11 they might decide they, to just yeah. shorten their hours exactly exactly so with special permits it's uh i mean we can we can give guidelines to say this is still by special permit but it can't be you know more than this or it can't be you know restricted less than this or something like that right we can give guidelines to in the zonings bylaws personally i like them having discretion based on the use yeah. and the location and you know i personally am a proponent a fan of the proponent saying this is what i want right rather than regulating before you get requests but that's actually i think that i think that planning ahead for what we might want helps us more in terms of you know shaping the community than just letting whoever's on this the planning board. advisory board decide you know? planning board to planning board doesn't issue special permits for the most part it's every single what? one of them except the the marijuana dispensary is listed as a zoning advisory board so that uh. i've reviewed it <laughs> Oh. That's very strange. Yeah. Planning board doesn't issue special permits. Not not the special permits that for for um, the uses for businesses, you know, in the industrial A, industrial B, downtown business, all of those districts. It's zoning advisory board. A special permit. Zoning board of, board of appeals. Yes, that's what I mean. <laughs> okay. What did I say? <laughs> zoning advisory board. Yeah, which that's is what us. we're we're, we're <laughs> this one. Zoning board of appeals. Yes, okay. zoning board of appeals. Um, so, so yeah, it's uh, very few. It's developments, residential developments that we, you know, we do special permits on planning board for that. But it's generally the businesses are. Is it not part of site plan review? Yeah. Special permits part of site plan uh, review. Yeah, typically. but but all the all the business districts, industrial A, industrial B. Special permit, it says special permit by, is granted by, for all the, the uses. For, okay. yeah. So, 
I don't know. We could get clarification yeah, on I that. Mean, that's true. So I just checked on the industrial areas. Certain uses are allowed by the Board of Appeals. I don't know if hours would be something you would regulate by site plan, though. That's more of... Is it a general bylaw? Is what a general bylaw? Hours of operation? No, so they're regulated in the zoning in, in various in points. So that table, that... that Okay. Have, this that list shows where it's actually regulated. All the restrictions, if any restrictions are there. Yeah. So like industrial doesn't have any restrictions on hours. No industrial uses are restricted by hours in the zone. Well, I know with with Price Chopper, the planning board is the is the board that determined that 24 hours would be okay. Okay. So. So why I'm would that just be? saying if that was done in site plan review, that's possible. They could have made that a condition of approval. But that's that might not be the most appropriate way. place for it. I guess that's the only place to regulate that if it's done by right, right? So if they don't have to get a special permit by the board of appeals, there's nothing in a special permit that would regulate their hours. So so the site plan approval would be the only way to regulate their hours through a permit, if that were the case. So if, if somebody came into say I don't know the the business. Like off of 495, but not an in industrial A or industrial B, and they want it to be 24 hours. What prevents them from being 24 hours, if it's a use that's allowed by right? Nothing. Hence the issue, because <laughs> they're in the business district. They're not in industrial A or B. That's what the, the key was. Is what he said was it was that a business? A. Yeah, was that a business district before they got there? Yes. So I guess if they needed site plan review, that would be a place to regulate the business hours. Since there is no special permit required, I. I because the planning board also gave Dunkin' Donuts twenty four hours. Did they not? Was that no. not in their site plan review? I don't think they're 24 hours. I'm not saying that it wasn't done in site plan review. I'm saying I don't believe that's the most appropriate place for it to be okay. done if a special permit is being also issued. Because a special permit would regulate the use, and the use and the business hours are kind of tied together rather than site plan, which is really the design and the layout of the site. Yeah. But if there is no site, if there is no special permit being issued, so like in your example where they're in a they're a by right use in a business mm -hmm. area, and there is no special permit needed. The only avenue for regulation of business hours would be during site plan review. And if there's no site plan review because they're occupying a building that's already built, then there would be no review of their hours. Right? Yeah. That's a bit well, of I'm going to change, change my point. statement that yeah. I, would, I would like there to be some restriction, but I would like the proponent to be able to discuss that and if if your regulation said 10 and they wanted to stay open until 11 then they could go for a variance right or a uh, special permit special permit yeah so i mean one easy easy way of doing that is just putting in a provision in a different section of the zoning bylaws that says the town wide hours of operation are from x to y and to go outside of those hours would require a special permit by the planning board Okay, so let's um, let's put down each district separately. I mean, not. I mean, we can lump all the residential districts together if we want to, but and agricultural because that's already restricted, 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. But um, let's consider whether or not there'd be separate um, hours that we would recommend in in various districts. Don't we regulate noise in the industrial A and industrial B? That, that That's a good point. <laughs> I mean, I, it seems to me that I've read that, I mean, you, you can't hear what's going on in there beyond a certain, you know, outside the walls of the operation. So if, if that's already being regulated, is it, does that ring a bell to anybody else or is that, just, am I just, Dreaming this, I thought we that in the zoning bylaws already in industrial A and B that were 
there there are rules that say you can't all noise has to be contained within the structure but that doesn't keep you from coming and going at whatever hour but noise is I, I would think that noise is the biggest thing that that would concern people the second thing is how many people are coming and going Who, who's who's working that third shift in the, the new biotech facility that and used lights. to run 24 hours a day. And lights. Is it a lot? Yeah, if you have a whole floor of office lights on, that can create a lot of light. Yeah, this, it's light pollution. And I personally see it more as, you know, less the industrial districts because because it's it's really it's almost the retail that I would I would like to see encouraged in the business districts not in the industrial districts because the industrial districts as you say it's it's within the confines of the building <clears throat> and so whatever they're doing there I mean <laughs> Through the chair, just to answer your question about the regulation of noise, the only thing that's actually regulated in the zoning bylaw is wind energy. There's a, a limit that it can make a certain amount of noise. Everywhere else, it's just no detrimental noise or no excessive noise. It doesn't actually put like a limit as to how much noise can be done. Huh. That's interesting. Because I think we had some clauses in, was it? Indoor recreation. Indoor recreation. We had specific clauses regarding the noise not reaching the confines of the the lot. Right. <laughs> Beyond that, but not any other businesses, huh? Uh, just on a quick yeah. Yeah, search through, but I'd have to give it a, a, another. But nothing came up that aside from the wind energy that That's actually regulated by like decibel. Metric. So right, Sorry, yeah. Go ahead. Quick question. You say, for instance, in industrial A, the Dell EMC has basically majority of their operations of servers and networks and stuff like that, which need to be opened by, they have to take care of them. There is always going to of be course. somebody in their yeah. shifts and stuff like mm -hmm. that. The business hours limit that too? No. Right now, we have only retail within the industrial A and B district is limited. Mm -hmm. um, and... Um, no other uses, just the retail use is no, limited to 10 p.m. I, I get that, but if, yeah. it's a, if it's a universal time limit, that it can it can be applied to anything. So maybe we have to be careful about not making it like universal. Not universal. Yeah, yeah that it has to be specific. To I, I agree with you completely, because I think it's just the retail and what else would it, you know, restaurant type of uses. It's, it's with customers coming and going. It's not operations within a building that really customers aren't coming and going. What I find interesting is that, so the Price Shoppers 24 hours, it's in the business district. The Cumberland Farms is in a, it looks like, it's rural business with an overlay. Is that rural business? Yeah, and then you've got downtown, which is business district as well. So we. If we were to pick business district and say, oh, you, you can be open 24 hours in business district, now all of a sudden you're opening it up to the downtown area being open 24 hours. And I don't know if that's the intent of the town or... No, we were talking about have, you know, saying it can be open till midnight, perhaps, or... Um, so that's a rural business where... Um, Cumberland Farms and yes. 110 Grill and things like that are. How wide is 110 Grill open? <laughs> 11, I think. I think they close at 10. 10 or 11? Okay. That's rural. Uh, that's rural business. Okay. And that's business district. And then downtown business district. They're open till 11 on Friday and Saturday, and then they close at 9 or 10 different days of the week. Yeah, that's what I thought. If, okay. Even if they want to open late, most some of them just want weekend late hours. Yeah. So. Okay. 
Hmm. Well, it sounds like we uh, we need a little bit more research on this. So, um, what were some of the things that John said you were gonna you were gonna search for us? So currently we don't have any like industrial slash office use that's 24 hours, third shift. We don't know. It's possible that they do. Any offices could, any manufacturing could be because it's fine to do so. Project just because. Might have people working overnight sorting stuff sometimes. Never know. So it sounds like uh, is there any way to find that out? I don't know. But you can ask Elaine. She would be yeah. okay. the best resource. That would be great. So at least we know if we're talking about a specific company or not. So one thing that you were going to do was was just verify um, with Elaine also the um, whether there's a formal process that any business needs to go through for for hours of operation for ZBA or if it's you know if it's a use by right if it just automatically just goes through and they can do whatever they want to which seems to be the case based on the zoning bylaws. Um, so just verify that kind of stuff with there may first. be there may be some business licensing process through the town there may be i don't know <clears throat> there's something that we're missing here um and then um What other research are we looking for? Um, businesses who, businesses in industrial districts um, currently um, working second shift, third shift, that sort of thing, operating. I don't know how. I, I'm sure we'd be able to find out, but I don't know how we, we can find out from technology companies because they don't have any business hours as such. Exactly. You can. So I don't know if professional office fits into that question, mm -hmm. but I'm sure there is an answer for that too. Yeah. 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 I agree because it's like they may not have a formal shift. Yeah. But they may, you know, certainly have people coming and going at odd hours. And not just that, because work. They, nowadays they work with different resources in different, based out of different countries. You have to work for the different timings and stuff like that too sometimes. So, mm -hmm. like, I'm, I'm trying to decide, I'm trying to think of any professional office that I've known, and do they have a business time that they give you? Like, yeah. I can't think of any, so I'm I can't think of any either. And in biotech, um, there's often experiments that have to be checked in the middle of the night you know <laughs> just based on the timing of you know when things started and things that happen over the weekend so every company i've ever been involved in has operations you know even if it's just a few people coming in and out of the lab or whatever or manufacturing so but usually when they do that the the building is closed you yeah. just have special access like right. as that individual yeah yeah no i agree but it's still, you know, there, there's still operations going on, but it's just more limited. On Golden Pond is going on. Hmm. That's true. It's a business. Yep. Yeah, Fairview is the same thing. Mm-hmm. Does, not to insert myself in this discussion, but do those matter? The businesses, the, the offices, the assisted living for this discussion? 
or is it more of businesses open to the general public? That That's what I concern. think is more important. That's mm -hmm. my it personal would, opinion. It wouldn't necessarily even be the third shift workers because the public's not going to get into those industrials. It's going to be the retail and the, the general commercial type. Yep. I mean, do you care if a warehouse is open 24 hours a day and people are packaging boxes to send out via Amazon? Well, the people who live near that might care, John, because there's truck traffic and things of that nature. But I'm, you know, I'm just playing, de again, devil's advocate. It's like a, I don't know who is third shift in this town, so. Can we limit truck hours or is that not allowed? A lot of commercial properties will limit truck hours. Okay. I'm just wondering, cause when I was up putting up the EHOP banner, it was like 5 in the morning, and it was just all semi-trucks going down May Street. And I was like, I didn't even know we had this much truck traffic in our Yeah, house. it's all coming past my neighborhood, too, West Main Street. <laughs> I don't think you can necessarily limit what goes through your town. You can limit Correct. the operations in your town. Right. Like, you can tell yeah. Dunkin' Donuts they can't have that's their through traffic. trash picked right. up at 4 a.m. Right, well, that's more what I was thinking. Or a, a, a business, like, if there was a warehouse or something, like, you can't have trucks coming between, like, you know, at 2 in the morning because that would be disruptive noise to the right. neighbors. That can be controlled. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I was thinking, right now it's open for everything, no matter what, if you're by right, by special permit, there is no way to look at the hours, right? There is nobody to, no way to stop them mm -hmm. from doing something. So maybe in the, in the special permit definition, the first line says the following uses shall be allowed in any, for example, industrial A district upon the grant of special permit by the Board of Appeals and at their discretion of what they did get to decide the hours to, some wording to say that just as a line, so they get the they have the power to do it, mm -hmm. how they do it, how they decide is completely up to them. But then, then it would still, you know, any uses by right, we still would not have it control if we put it just for the special permits. Mm -hmm. But but that's an option. Uh, yeah. Just to that's an option. Stop. Okay, so. Do we, uh, have we settled on what kind of research, what background we want information on? I'm gonna ask Elaine for who's doing third shift slash even though that's not the critical thing. Yeah. The critical thing is the retail slash gas station slash car wash, 24 hour car wash. If there's any other licensing or approval procedure that businesses may have to go through even right yeah. and and whether or not um, Elaine has gotten any sense through the years of businesses that would like to be open later than they are currently doing whether or not that's something that that has been restricted by you know a, a permit or agreement Hearing, I mean, since we're, the discussion was really focused on retail, and when we look at the downtown business district, there is no mention in the in the whole downtown business district about retail hours. I'm, I I did I don't know. So if um, well, if the muffin house decides that they want to start being open 24 hours mm -hmm. or the CBS. theoretically it should be possible for them to that's that's what I'm trying to understand is is it actually entirely the muffin house's <laughs> decision to right. open at certain time and end yeah, so close I mean, at a certain time under permitted uses in the downtown business district, bed and breakfast, retail stores, business offices, municipal, funeral homes, restaurants, mm -hmm. mixed use businesses, and accessory uses. But there's nothing in no. 21020 that says. Is, would it be in the general bylaws? For whatever reason, I think there's a general 10 o'clock restriction. Yeah, I think so too. And I don't know where it's coming from. 
but I think there's a 10 o'clock general restriction. So it must be somewhere must or be through some by process. 10 unless you get a an program. acceptance, to, exception to that. Okay. So I think we need to. Yeah, to do a little before this, we continue a little more this discussion because I think we're yeah. Going that's why you know I was surprised by circles. John's table that we have so few restrictions. But I'm like, then why aren't businesses open later? And, well, because you know? there's nobody. Well, nobody wants to do business with them, other than the hours that they're open. Yeah, <laughs> that's it's a it's a circle. <laughs> it's like people but don't CVS go down there because been, it's not open. CVS would have uh, <laughs> definitely would have stayed open later than 10 o'clock if they had the choice. Okay. All right. So there's clearly really? something oh, else going on. I'm sure. Okay. Absolutely. So we will revisit this at a future meeting with additional data. I wanted to give you the opportunity. I wasn't sure if you were here to speak on a particular topic. Okay. For, yep. Right. Absolutely true. Especially with traffic issues and everything. It's going to be more and more. Everybody wants to work flex hours. So that would be um, applicable to you know, industrial A, industrial B businesses that are non-retail, non-you know commercial focused. Um, yes. Do you and grandchildren in high school? And after they finish a big uh, running meet or something, and they kind of a little celebration, but they want to go out together, I don't like it that they have to drive to another town to go someplace and get, you know, something to eat. You know what I mean? And get on the way. That, that's yeah. a good point. And I'm just going to repeat. You can go at 10 o'clock to Bill's or someplace else mm -hmm. and celebrate together. So I'm just going to repeat it for the sake of, of the HCAM being able to, to hear your comment on that. And that, um, uh, so th this was just regarding um, after a, a, a sports event or, uh, in the case of my kids, a play or, <laughs> or a theater, you know, music event, that to go out after that event and celebrate, you know, for an hour or so at a restaurant, they're usually driving out of town because there's no place here to go to. So, um, and that's, you know, it's true. Can I get your name? Mm -hmm. Can I have your name? Janice Brown. Thank you. And, uh, yeah, I don't want my high schoolers on the road. I don't want them to be there. It's electric bus. <laughs> <laughs> so, Chair, good Chair. Uh, I quickly looked through the general bylaws, mm -hmm. and it looks like the uh, consumption of alcohol is regulated in there. Mm -hmm. uh, one o'clock is the latest time, but I didn't see anything else, so I can give that a, a closer look. Okay. Um, that was just a global search of hours. Yeah. So there might be a different wording. Okay. Okay, yeah, please do. Thank you. We're going to have you searching through all of the bylaws <laughs> in this whole town. Well, there must be some so history about the 10 o'clock hour. Oh, yeah. You know, and so we, none of us are old enough here to know what that history that was. Yeah, that's good. I mean, sense. but it would be nice to know what, what the actual history was, what was because I, I, the, the town fathers had some wisdom back when. Yeah. For things but that then, were very specific back then, sometimes it was, a very it was still good. Thing that, yeah, yeah, that so. may have been applicable. Yeah, for them. Oh, so so the other comment that Janice um, mentioned was about um, flex hours that are becoming more and more and more common, and mm -hmm. um, in in businesses, non-retail businesses. Um, so yeah, that's absolutely true. Um, and I certainly have experienced that in my own professional life. You know, it's like. Um, especially when I was commuting into Cambridge, <laughs> I'd go in really early to miss the traffic and then I'd come home early to miss the traffic. <laughs> so, yeah. Yes, Janice. So I was just thinking, and how will flex hours as it becomes more popular impact what people do after work and where they want to go? So that might be a growing trend, might impact um, downtown. Good point. I want to have a late supper. Like, 
11 o'clock at night. Right. Is there a place they can go? Yeah. And, um, and also, as we're trying to think about getting more young professionals downtown, like, like yourself, and <laughs> um, that obviously um, many of them may wish to have a little bit more activity a little bit later at night. So, okay. So, shall we move on to parking requirements for residential and commercial uses? Um, okay, so. Sorry, my computer closed. Okay, parking. So, I read, I read this whole thing. Thank you so much for putting this together. This was a, I can't take credit for this. This was a lane. Okay, it was, it was great. It's great. So, um, so I, I see, I, I read through the whole thing, actually backwards, so I could see like from the beginning where it started and, and how, um, uh, how we made changes um, over the time. And um, I think what we wanted to consider um, was, for one, is the downtown business district um, parking requirements, are they adequate? Um, the, um, the, let's see what time it was put into place. The, um, the requirements for the downtown business dis district was cut in half. Um, for each business type um, years ago. I don't recall exactly when it was. Um, and that certainly was to reflect the fact that there wasn't as much parking in that area, and so it was very, very difficult for businesses to meet the minimum requirements. Um, and also, theoretically, it could be because you're going to get some walking traffic from downtown for downtown businesses um, rather than all driving. Go ahead. If I can interject, part of, part of the reason that came about is there was a survey done of downtown and available spaces not necessarily on a business owner's property mm -hmm. but available nearby. So the parking requirement to have parking spaces available on site in the downtown area we thought was prohibitive for businesses to come into into town. If we held them to the same standard and they're taking up a small office front or storefront, they don't have on-site parking to adequately address the parking needs as they were established for that use. And we did a survey, a rather in intensive survey of, of traveling around town and looking at all the public spaces to see if they could pick up the additional parking requirement. And we felt that there was, at that time, we felt there was adequate parking in town, not necessarily on an individual site to accommodate for that retailer's need. All right. And was this the study that John was referring to last time, 10 to 12 years ago that was done? Yep. For my time. No. <laughs> and we did. We went every hour to all the public spots to see how many spaces were available. Number of days. It was fun. <laughs> so I know in the town of Natick, because I'm going through this right now with a cafe, that the town of Natick will allow a certain amount of public spaces per square certain amount of square feet for a straight retailer. And then there's like some other designation for restaurants, because restaurants are more parking intensive than retail. Mm -hmm. And you know they work it out that way. You take all the municipal parking spaces, and then you take all the square footage, and there's a slightly you know more intense uh, for the restaurants than it is for the retail. But just by unilaterally saying, oh, you know, we only are going to do half of all of our bylaw, parking bylaw, 
for all these uses doesn't really jive with the availability. Um, again, since I've been doing volunteer work, everyone's complaining about the lack of parking in downtown Hockington. But Carol's pointed out to me that there are times where the parking shifts significantly so that there is, you know, more turnover than there may have been used to before. Mm -hmm. And that when you have a new opera, you know, a new restaurant opening, everyone wants to go there and that's when it gets really, really crowded. Or if we're having a meeting here at town hall and a new restaurant, and, you know, it's like the, those are the exceptions. It's not the pattern of the constant. I don't know. I think that probably we have to look at it again just to see what other things are going to happen in terms of new businesses coming to downtown. Well, how many parking spaces did we just buy at town meeting? Uh, about 30 for town hall, Mark would not lot in tax spaces, approximately 33. So 60 something. That's a big, big increase. Mm -hmm. So the town hall spaces would be um, occupied by town employees and people coming to do business here um, during, the day. during the day, but in the evening it'll be available as public parking and weekends. And um, even during the day, it's not necessarily going to be filled up with town employees because a lot of the town staff is out doing things you know, in and out throughout the day as well. The zoning enforcement officer and what, I mean, they're not necessarily sitting at a desk in 95. Mm -hmm. So I think e even though there are a lot of employees, I don't think that they're going to utilize all of those things all of the time. Right. Even during the day, they will probably be in that positive addition. And they must be parking somewhere now. They're parking in Bill's parking lot. St. John's uh -oh. is the municipal lot. Yeah, so um, there's a small space at the corner of Bills. Maybe fits like six cars. Six yeah. cars. Um, and then uh, at People Park, St. John's, or um, on the common. Okay. I would say mostly on at St. John's. So one thing that I certainly have noticed um, is that you know when when I talk to people who are in the know <laughs> on these committees and the planning board and so on, um, people say things like, "The library, people can park at the library. That's you know that's been allowed, you know, and uh, people can people can park you know various places. So um, other than street parking, um, anybody not from this town or even in the town and not in the know wouldn't know that." because there's nothing pub posted that says, if there's space here, you can park here. You don't have to be going into the library, you know? So people wouldn't assume that. We have to do, you know, when we, when we build our municipal lots and so on, we have to do a much better job of putting up signs so that any stranger coming to town is saying, okay, I'm going to the Central Public House, and where can I park? And you know they're going to look for the parking signs, and there's no parking signs any place. So, no. there are typically open spaces in the CVS. Right. I would not park there personally. Coming from out of town, coming to a business here, I would not park there because I would think, well, that belongs to the CVS. But CVS does, does not post signs there saying do not park here. I know, but at the same time, it also doesn't like say you can park here. Establishment in yeah. town. But also, when you're coming down like Central Public House or if another restaurant opened on Main Street, there is that parking for those buildings that you have to go down Walcott Street to get to, and mm -hmm. a lot of people don't know that they can park exactly. there. Exactly, they don't there's know. There's no signs on there's Main no Street. There's no signs. Or yeah. I don't think there's... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's the problem. It's like because we're not telling people, oh, parking is right there. Um, <laughs> so, so that's the, I think that's a bigger problem than than um, you know than even the spaces, the available spaces. Because hey, if we have available spaces, great, but we have to tell people where they are. <laughs> so, well, once you get municipal parking, you can do that. You can't yeah. currently do that 
at CVS. Private. Absolutely. To Ron's point, I, I am of the opinion that if a property owner does not post in their parking lot, you can only park here if you're frequenting, I would park there. Yeah. I would park, I'd park in Hopkinton Drug if they didn't have all their, you know, <laughs> indications that I shouldn't be. Yeah, this is true. The big challenge for downtown parking is going to be the downtown corridor improvement. Yeah. When that's torn up for a couple of years and the on-street parking is not available, it's going to be a, a nightmare for downtown businesses. Mm -hmm. That's true. So, yes. I mean, long term, it'll, everything will be a lot better, but the next couple of years are going to be very difficult for the downtown business community. So, other than what Rhea was saying about, you know, the parking requirements for downtown shouldn't just be half of what it you know, should be a more rational. <laughs> um, right. <laughs> determination mm -hmm. but other than that um, and and we're, we're obviously in a temporary situation where um, we're gonna have the downtown corridor project which is gonna temporarily eliminate our, our on-street spaces and then we're also going to have the new public parking which is not going to be built for at least another year or two or <laughs> hopefully not longer than that um, but um, other than that, you know, do you feel like the um, any of the calculations for parking need to be revised? Do you feel like any of them are obviously lacking appropriate amount? Well, I, I think that you know, in Paul Mastrani group made the the press for doing this project in downtown, they, the project looked way under parked. Mm -hmm. And it was because it was mixed use. And it was, you know, then he came back and said, oh no, no, we're gonna do parking underneath the building and do all this other stuff. And obviously the project's not gonna go forward, but I'm just saying it's like, that's the kind of thing where we're trying to, you know, figure out what the design of this project's gonna look like and there's no reasonableness to the parking right <laughs> ratios at a hall because he have to, he's building the building partially on spec where you don't know how many restaurants are going to be in that specific space mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so and you want to keep these guys in business once they do you know put their life savings up and try to open their doors and you know they they do that and then they can't get I mean the nail salon down at uh, the Starbucks Center is like you know dying for business there's just not enough parking there. Unibank, you know, probably survives because of the drive-thru. But that, that, these are real life issues for the people who are, you know, renting these spaces. And that calculation was done based on? That was done because we didn't have proper parking for restaurants. And Starbucks was identified as a retail use back then. So was Duncan. Okay. <laughs> so it's not so, so this 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 stuff right here, John Catino and the, the group that I was part of, we did we did this this these, restaurants one for yeah. every three seats things? Yeah. But that was after. That was after the fact. Okay. Yeah. So it was it was counted as retail so using that as an example so if we can be if we can clarify zoning about because you the downtown business district again just as an example the small retail outlets in in those um, those older buildings downtown that are vacant right now those for instance it makes sense that you know, a retail use is not going to require a lot of parking. You know, it's going to be a couple of spaces. The, um, the requirements that we have currently for retail, I can't remember where it, what it is, but, but it seemed reasonable when I was looking at it for a space like that. 
four, four parking spots per thousand square feet of gross floor area. Okay. So one of those that is that is a, a normal number, by yeah. the way. Yeah. By all so standards, it seems it seems reasonable. Right, but when you cut that in half, yeah, that's when things get hairy because you're still talking about like an employee or two employees, and then a couple of customers. You see what I'm saying? That's when it gets like right. But once we have municipal parking. Mm -hmm. That would be adequate for a business like that. However, for a, for businesses such as 76 Main Development, and let's let's just assume there will be a development like that at some point downtown. There will be a mixed use development like that. So let's think about you know how how the zoning could be reworded such that it would actually provide an adequate minimum parking for a mixed use development in the downtown area. So, because they did the calculations based on residential. Yeah, but there's gonna be 60 something spaces flooding the market at this point. So I'm not sure that now that this is the right time. Do you see what I'm saying? It's like, yeah. But I still think a large mixed-use development such as that would not be. It it didn't make any sense. Would no. not be no. Would not be able to to rely on those municipal parking spaces because it would be too big. It, the the uses would be too. Well, it was like it two too many or customers. It was two, was it two levels of residential yeah. and one level of retail. retail. Retail, slash the retail becomes like a service, like let's say financial services, and you've got like I don't know nine, and you know advisors in the space, and they're seeing customers. I mean that's like that's like the maximum of a retail space situation because it's sort of a service office kind of a thing. Um, and we just need to be able to calculate out that there's enough spaces for everybody. Right. But do you think, anyone, do you think that it is appropriate to try to reword any of the parking requirements downtown? Is it something that we, we should try to tackle? Or is it something that is too prescriptive and needs to be more of a case-by-case -case basis situation? I think the mixed use ones are so difficult because you, you don't know what the mix is going to be. It's a single use, and you know this particular pricing, I mean, parking. Sometimes it's self-selective, because that, a lot of restaurants said no to um, the central public house because they didn't see the parking. And it's all a matter of calculating numbers of what you do for sales and where to pay rent, so it's, it's like, okay, if I can't put, you know, 200 seats in this location because I can't see the, you know, the 75 parking spaces plus the five for my employees, it's self-selecting. It's like they're not going to go there. Right. And that's to the end of what you said is that you try to loosen it up. But I think there's a big difference between loosening up retail and loosening up restaurants with the one exception of that financial advisory idea that I just came up with. But, but you still need to meet even, even no matter where you are, you need to meet the requirements of whatever the use is. On right? site. On site. So I, I'm sort of the impression that this is being pushed in part because of that nail salon, bank, Starbucks that's down the street that has horrible parking. Yeah. But that's not because their parking requirement was cut in half. It's because people never leave Starbucks. Right. And Starbucks was a retail use and not a restaurant right. use. That's not a parking problem. That's a classification problem. Mm -hmm. If we had said Starbucks is a restaurant, mm -hmm. then the parking requirement would have been different. And if that parking requirement was different, would there still be a problem? The nail salon has, I think, three spots or four spots. It has minimal parking. There are 12 chairs in there. It, it doesn't to make be any pedicured. sense. Yeah. 
and you can you could have 20 people in there getting their nails done you could have 50 people in there right and you've got four parking spots right but it's it's not because the requirement was cut in half no i it's, know it's because the use was poorly defined and in a mixed use situation personally and i could be wrong and John maybe has considerably more experience at this than I do. But if it's, you know, two floors of residential and one floor of retail, all the residential people are leaving during the day. So those spaces become available for the retail use. Wouldn't the residential but people have assigned spots, though? Well, that's the thing. That's what we actually the discussed with them. The but I don't think you can count on everyone leaving every day. No, but it's it's not. You don't have five uses in this multi, you know mixed use building that all five uses are occurring at the same time. Right is my point. So you don't need to necessarily add the requirements for each use together and have that total because they they vary in time. If you have a restaurant or a nightclub, the hours of operation could be different than the bank on that property. Mm -hmm. They theoretically could use the same spots because no one's going to the bank at 10 o'clock at night, you know? Yeah. So I, I think we have one site that, that has a huge parking problem, but that appears more to be the result of how we classified the business than mm -hmm. the regulation associated with That's the business. That's exactly what happened, yeah. Mary, back to your question of mm -hmm. should we try to tackle the formulas for these parkings? I, I'm not aware of any specific concerns that say we have to do that now. I mean, the, the restaurant at, at, at Central Public House that finally got there after a lot of people saying there's not enough parking, somebody finally said, We're, we'll try to make a go of this. Mm -hmm. And I think town meeting did a great job by approving, you know, acquiring some municipal parking in downtown that will begin to, to take us another level. So I, I'm not sure that there's a problem that we're trying to fix mm -hmm. by looking at the, at the formulas. I, I, yeah, I, I, I'm also concerned that it's, an, it's going to change soon. Right. So we do something and then it changes. It yeah. changes and then I would rather wait until we figure out what it's going to look like in three years from now. <laughs> I think the bigger question is why is Starbucks a retail? Why is Dunkin' Donuts a retail? Well, that was way back when. It's no longer that way. They're considered restaurants. That was part of this bylaw change that was done a couple years back. We, we did we did not have we did not have a different differentiation for retail and restaurant use back then. Everything was classified retail for parking for parking. Well, when we, when we ten twelve years ago we changed the parking restriction for restaurants, so there must have been something that said restaurants need this. I'm just telling you, I I, I mean I got plucked out of the world and landed in Zach and. We were having to do this, and that was done a couple of years ago. I think we, we actually worked on it in 2016, and then it was approved in 2017. Yes. So in terms of Ron's suggestion to table this. I agree. I think there's just too much that's going to change in the next couple of years. Carol? I'm happy leaving my alone right now. Okay. And Rhea? Yeah. I, now, that we, now that we've got the 60 plus spaces coming along, we'll see what happens, how it gets absorbed. All right. We'll all keep an eye on it. Leave it alone. Yeah. Sure. Was that an official vote? It wasn't a vote, was Should it? We, vote? we need to vote table. to table something? Okay. Just an official. All right. I guess we can vote. To make a motion to table the parking discussion. And second all in that? Favor? Hmm? Oh, yep. I'm sorry. I Can said second that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> At least second to that. Okay, I didn't hear. Um, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? 
All right. We have tabled it. So, um, who needed to leave at eight? Me. Okay. I'm, I'm stalling. <laughs> You're stalling. <laughs> All right. So, what I would like to go through briefly, since we have concluded our discussions for tonight, is the action item list that I had put together. This, I, I, I didn't put due dates on this because really what it is is we need to do certain research before we discuss certain items. What I need to do next, now that I've got this action item list put together, is, is make it refer to the item numbers on the work plan so it's easier to cross-reference them. Um, okay? And there are not... Um, people assigned to each and every one of them because when we were discussing these last week um, certain ones were things that people either volunteered for or we asked John to do for us <laughs> but not everything got assigned not everything was was obvious um, and and it doesn't have to be all assigned right now it's just something that at some point in the future, we don't want to put things on the agenda until we have we know that the research is being done in preparation for that meeting. Okay, so I would like to decide what we're going to do at our next meeting, and then and make sure that we can have the research done for it. Okay. 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 So one of the things is that I added the action items regarding business hours to this for John to work on. And we don't necessarily have to discuss it at the next meeting. It's just on our list now, okay? Okay, so um, I know that Rhea has been sending um, some information on, that cover a number of these different topics. Um, so one was, you talked about the educational uses, which is the first one on here. Um, and uh, you found several other example bylaws of educational uses specifically being highlighted in order to, um, to encourage them in certain areas. So that's one thing. Okay, solar farm overlay. Had you gotten any information on that one? No, I don't think you did. I don't think I said yeah, Ted. Oh, Ted. Yep. Okay, sounds good. And I have not contacted Mass Bio yet. Um, Rhea also found today or yesterday some information on. Um, electric buses and subsidies of some sort. Grants. Grants. Mm -hmm. Massachusetts have got a million Ron, seven fifty. Yeah, I don't know if you had buses. any chance to. Done okay. Anything on that yet? <laughs> um, draft table of zoning. That's just a rewriting things. Um, that is, and and some of these things I'm going to pick up um, over the summer. Get, a, get some things down in writing for us to look at at future meetings, so. Um, and John, um, I'm, I'm really gonna leave some of this to you in terms of um, things that specifically have your initials next to it. Um, if you decide that, yeah, this is something I can work on right now and then you get something together, then we can get it onto the agenda at any, any point afterwards. But in terms of the order in which they're done, um, a lot of it can be based on your time and, and availability for those resources. On okay. that note, um, I did some research on the level three biotech facility definition. Mm -hmm. I drafted a memo, but I'll finish it up for the next meeting. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Um, quick overview or, or wait? A quick overview or a memo ahead of time? Do you want me to give a quick overview now? Sure, go ahead. It's pretty simple. 
So I think this level three biotech was not very clear, but there is a level three biosafety. So there's four biosafety levels and level three is a reasonable way to, or these levels are a reasonable way to uh, regulate the biotech industry in terms of uses because level four is the most dangerous, I guess, because it's got the uh, highest level of infectious infectious diseases and stuff like that. And level three, so they're based on certain uh, safety requirements. Um, and so level three, there's, a, a, I think, 1,500 across the country. Um, and level four, I want to say there's like 18. Yeah, so, there's very few. Yeah, there's very few. So I think that's what it is, and I've got all those definitions in a memo, and I can distribute that. Okay. Thanks. Um, for the, we're looking at the large parcels. Um, I think Elaine was actually, we talked to her about doing this um, a few months ago before you were here. And that was just to provide a list of the large undeveloped or partially developed parcels um, in town that you know may be subject to future development um, that you know it might be something that's relatively easy to do um, so I just wanted to point that one out and I have some materials related to that too um, that has to do with um, the um, the conference that we went to on mm -hmm. land uses and so on. On the wireless communication bylaws, um, Elaine had pointed that out too. So if there's anything specific that you know that she can let us know was changed in the federal and needs to be changed in our bylaws that could be a quick one you know that we can write up and get ready for for next town meeting some of the things that are we need legal either legal or staff help on um, I think you might need to review internally um, and determine how much you know, and, and it could be, you know, I could come in for a meeting too with you and Elaine um, and we can talk about, you know, what's really needed in terms of um, whether or not it's a legal counsel thing or whether or not you guys have um, the expertise to do all these, all these different things. Transfer of development rights, for instance, what's, what's allowed and, you know, what examples we have and so on. So, um, and the fire chief, is this something that you can just reach out to the fire chief and ask about the um, um, sprinklers, um, residential sprinklers, and what he um, what he would like in terms of the guidelines there for certain residential sprinkler use? Where is this one? Oh God, I don't know. Um, second second page in the middle. Got it. I'll reorganize this. Yep. <laughs> I promise. <laughs> I just had to just get it down on paper at first. Okay. I haven't heard from John Coutinho about the, the site walk at the professional office district park, but I'll remind him. Okay. Okay. Did anything jump out of people for a good topic for the next meeting? Sure, but I, st I started looking at a little bit of the reverse commuting uh, area. So mm -hmm. from for that, I was thinking, I, I drove from, I ended up driving to Franklin, that fr uh, the Liberty Mutual building from Ashland side, and it looks like it's a 1.3 or 1.4 mile from Ashland to station, mm -hmm. but there is no way to connect it. And even the w uh, M uh, MWRTA, the Route 5 starts from, the only one that co comes into Hopkinton starts from Framingham, Ashland, and just comes into South Street and Price Chopper. Does seems to be, there is no connectivity to the South Borough station, 
there is no connectivity to Ashland to fr from Ashland to there is nothing to that goes to Perkin Elmer or anything like that. Mm -hmm. So that could be something we should consider. I was thinking if the, if I, I I have I don't have it concrete, but if something a route runs from Ashland Station mm -hmm. to Liberty Mutual Building, comes to Perkin Elmer mm -hmm. um, or South Borough Station, and then Perkin Elmer South Street, that loop could cover everything in Hopkinton. Yeah, and. Uh, no. Looks like they have for Boston Scientific. They have Boston Scientific specific commuting routes that they have created. So maybe if a bunch of businesses from Hopkinton ask for a specific route, maybe they can give us something instead of like one of us asking. Mm -hmm. Would that be a possibility? Would other companies be interested in using the commute other than like whatever commuting option? Other than yep. Just to bring you up to date on the professional office, which is a segue from yours. Uh, John and I met last week and then on Wednesday, and then Rhea and John and I met on Friday. Uh, we talked about different uses. We're looking at that. In that conversation, we got into buses and, and routes and how far the crow flies from here to there and to get to that property. And um, John, if, if you are feeling up to giving your bus explanation or sure. Um, public transportation explanation again, that so would be great. So we had, uh, through the MAPC swap organization, agency, I forget how they define it, but um, we had a meeting here in Hopkinton last week about TMAs. Uh, again, I know get to it, so I still don't even remember what they're called, what they're stand for. Transportation something something. But essentially what they are is um, <coughs> bus lines or shuttle buses to fill that first mile, last mile gap. Um, and how there's TMAs all over Massachusetts. There's a Metro West 495 TMA that serves uh, a bunch of communities, and it's worth looking into for Hopkinton because to have um, a, a shuttle bus that essentially does what you were saying, where it goes from one train station to areas of activity, um, would be helpful. The, the, there's some initial cost to start it up and some organization, and it, there's some things that need to happen on the business level and on the nonprofit level to get them started for the most part. Um, but there are experts out there that we can reach out to to get this, get at least have somebody come in and talk to us about it. Um, but how it's paid for is basically by these companies. Uh, and they just need, the, the problem is having them see the worth mm -hmm. of this for their employees uh, to get the buy-in um, and then moving forward from there. That's what I was concerned about. So I'll, there's already a route that comes from Ashland to South Street. If it's not being used much, how do we convince them to mm. add new routes into Hopkinton? It's what I was... Now, what's, what route is it? Route 5, MWRTA. It's MWRTA. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I mean, encouraging public transit is always difficult. So that would be something to look at. Does anything come up the chamber for discussions of public transport? No, I mean, we've, we've had discussions with the MWRTA in the past, and they've basically come in and said, here are our current routes. Okay. And that's the discussion kind of ended there. Okay. So I think that the, the TMA thing has a lot more promise if we can encourage the businesses to contribute to get the, get the routes in. Mm -hmm. What's the timeline on Lycan building their building? Anybody know? They said from town meeting three years till they were fully staffed, right? Yeah, That's I, my recollection. I, they're, they're still outfitting the building, so they're they're probably six months out from having employees in there, if not a year. And they started with very few employees mm -hmm. in their in their schedule. Year two. Okay. Um, what is what is the best way to reach out to um, Lycan and other businesses on South Street to see if we can get a group of them together? Because you know, I I imagine that. Um, you know, 
each individual business might consider um, is this cost effective for me to consider a shuttle bus but um, but we can at least facilitate some discussions among businesses to see if there's any interest in that it, it may be uh, just publicizing a public hearing to say here's what's available do you have a representative that would like to come to a meeting and discuss this to find out about it? I mean, Perkin Elmer is, a, is you know, the, the largest biotech company in, in town, so they, they would be a good place to start. Okay. I don't know if we can get anybody from Dell to show up because they tend to be very uh, Texas-oriented right now. Mm -hmm. So if I may jump in at that, it might make more sense to have a conversation with Metro West TMA mm -hmm. um, to see what kind of program, just even a skeleton type program can be developed so that you're bringing something to these companies right. rather than saying, here's a general idea, an amorphous idea, why are you interested? But okay. if, we, if we can talk to somebody and say, look, this is what we're interested in, in doing in town, can we count on you to jump in at the ground level. Okay, good. They must have a, a methodology to bring things in already established. The companies or TMA? TMA. So it's not, it, it's not in one organization in the state. It's like smaller organizations that start up on their own. But there are enough in the region that have start, started up on their own that they could probably give us some expertise some guidance. and guidance. And Metro S495 may, I don't exactly know how their network operates, mm -hmm. but there could be a possibility that we get absorbed into that and just have a Hopkinton specific one or maybe there's a route that works for a couple towns. Um, but it would be worth talking to somebody there first to kind of get an understanding as to what opportunities are already out there yeah. and how we can tie into those. That makes sense yeah. to me. That would be huge. That, yeah, would be. Good. Let's have a goal for that, um, you know, at least having some individual meetings with them um, in the next, uh, you know, three, four months. And then, and then, after that point, I you know, I see this as a long term <laughs> project. It's like something for for that we're gonna have to just build on and and work with companies and you know, it might take five years or longer. Um, but but it's you know, if we start working on it now, um, it could work in tandem with new businesses developing in town the professional office park that we're trying to get you know it's it's gonna all go hand in hand but if we get some of this groundwork done we we might be ready to to help encourage those things so so are you are you suggesting that john reach out to them first to see if they've got any sort of for yeah that'll be the first starting steps spots and then for we us can you know have, <laughs> have smaller groups of us you know uh, along with the professional staff, um, meet up with with MWRTA or other organizations that we find that are useful, helpful to these things, and then and then do the public forum. Invite certain businesses, all all the businesses, but you know, do our best to encourage certain larger businesses to come and see us <laughs> and talk about it. Okay, good. So this is a long-term, longer term. Well, we have some information, John, that, that talks about the companies in town and how many employees there are, don't we? I assume somewhere. I mean, that's a start so that you, you know, we can target the, the bigger companies and see the ones that are growing and you know, because I think employers would see that as a benefit having some kind of transportation service because you can get people from the train here 
instead of more cars on the on the on the street. So that was a point that the three representatives from the regional uh, TMAs brought up: is that it makes sense to a lot of people, but the decision makers don't generally think that way. They may think, well, I don't need it, so why would anyone else need it? So it's getting past that if that is an issue. Um, and they, they said they've all experienced that. So as, as clear cut and as mm -hmm. logical they can make it, there's still pushback from certain executives that say, I don't think our, my employees need it. And then when they actually do get around to convincing them, it's a, you know, a complete 180 and they say, wow, this, is, this was great. But <laughs> getting over that hump is, right. is an issue for everybody. So hopefully if we do something like this, we'll have to put that's something to be aware of. A good PR campaign. I think we have a lot of self-educating and learning a lot of things before we go anywhere near people outside of here. Like mm -hmm. Collecting feedback. I agree. Yeah. Anyway, I apologize, but okay, cool. you gotta go. Thanks, Sarah. <laughs> you made it longer than you said. So I did. That's good. I did. Thank you. <clears throat> okay. So, so why don't we um, use the information that Rhea has gathered already on educational use, um, specifically called out for other in other towns. I only sent that to you. Yeah, you did? Yeah, I didn't send it to the... Yeah, I, I'm I only sending you things to you just so you can just make the decision of whether or not you want to distribute it. Right. I I, I understood that, okay. and I, I will send it out. I will curate and send it out to other people. Um, so uh, I suggest that for our next meeting. We can go through that simply because we have some of the research done already. Um, thank you very much, Ria. I appreciate that. Um, and. That will make for a more productive discussion. Um, you want to add the bio safety level three discussion? That sounds good. And that's related to the biotech allowable use by right versus by special permit. So okay. So we'll we'll do those two things for our next meeting. Okay. Everybody good? Um, nope. Can I just? Throw in something random before. Sure, we go ahead. Do we have any zoning laws currently for um, buildings that are declared historic in terms of like maintenance of them? Does anybody know? No, but I'm just wondering because I'm hearing a lot of people, especially from the historical society, trying to get buildings declared historic in town, which I'm not against, but. I believe if we're going to be declaring more buildings historic in town, there needs to be some kind of law protecting that they don't just fall apart and fade into nothing. So maybe something just proposing some basic level of maintenance or appearance. Would that, that would be us, right? That would be the zoning? I, I, um... Wouldn't that fall under the zoning enforcement officer? To, to make sure the buildings are not unsafe. But not just but unsafe, I think it's some of them are just complete eyesores. And people who own them don't care to maintain them because they purchase them for other purposes. So the issue um, in regulating that is there's, there's really no metric to regulate. So you can't say at what level does it become blighted? Um, at what level do, how much work do they need to put in to get it past that threshold that then is it not an issue? Could we write it though? Like specific things like the yard needs to be maintained, the paint can't be chipping more than, I don't know, like the rest of the neighbors around it or something. Or if like... Shh. You can. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's possible. It's, it's going to be very difficult and it's going to probably meet a lot of challenges. Okay. I'm just Not just in writing it, but if it were to get past challenges from people saying, well, mine doesn't count because X, Y, and Z. And then, so it's, I mean, I'll leave it up to you guys if you want to look into it, but that's, that's a, I mean, that's a worldwide issue because 
Um, I know specifically in England, there's a lot of uh, historic restrictions on properties, especially in the countryside, and theirs are very stringent in that if you want to re-slate your roof, you need to use slate from the exact same uh, quarry that it was originally gotten from, and that can be prohibitively expensive. So a lot of these historic properties just fall into disrepair because the owners can't afford to keep them up. Yeah, no, I, I understand that um, where, where I'm from, there's some ridiculously restrict laws on historic homes, but I'm more talking about just for example, if a developer bought one and it was declared historic and then they just let the property just fall to pieces because then, you know, what's the point of it being historic if it's just going to fall and decay? Well, despite the, the, the most recent case, the way that a lot of towns um, do get people to invest in their buildings is to give them an incentive. Okay. In other words, a carrot versus a stick. Okay. And um, they can do it in um, some kind of a shared tax rebate of some sort. Um, and that way, people are a little more um, willing to, to look at the cost um, and, and work at it, you know, directly. The last case at town hall, at town meeting, was completely crazy. So that's not, a, not something to try to change historical you know guidelines for maintenance on that one particular item but it's uh like i said i think if you do um emphasize to somebody that there's a there's an opportunity for them to save on their taxes or some kind of incentive that way you normally get a better response do we have anything like that in this time we do not can i ask you to take that as an action item to talk to the Di um, historic district commission or the sure. chair person or at least and and just you know gather a little information sure thanks okay any other items for discussion i'll entertain a motion to adjourn Second. Move. Second. All in, All in favor? favor. Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? All right. We're adjourned. Thank you very much.